Hello, everybody. We'll get started, and it's great to be back. Today, in our ongoing series uh, of virtual Connect sessions, we have Design for Healing, Dignity, and Joy, Best Practices in the Emerging Field of Trauma-Informed Design, led by people right here in Colorado. You'll get one health, safety, and welfare credit for attending today's session, which is great news. If this isn't HSW, I don't know what is. Um, and we also expect for it to be interactive, so please use the Q&A function uh, in your Zoom bar throughout today's session when you think of a question, and we'll be sure to get to it at the right time. We ask that you stick around until the end to make sure you get that full credit um, recorded on your transcript. I'm Mike Waldinger, CEO of AI Colorado, and it's great to be back, as I said earlier. We took a short break for our awards program, which was a lot of fun. You'll hear more about that at the end of today's session. Uh, in case you missed it, you can watch an encore presentation. Uh, one thing that we heard on, in the hiatus was uh, a member said, I've really enjoyed those webinars you're doing to keep the architecture community together. Um, and that is exactly the goal of what these are. A lot of times we think it's about professional development or just getting credits on your transcript, but it's so much more than that. So uh, we've enjoyed bringing them to you and showcasing some of the best of our members. So today we have three people joining us. I'll ask you uh, to say hello. Jennifer Wilson. Hi there. We have Chad Holtzinger. You can probably read these on your screen too, but <laughs> with the name. <laughs> Laura Ross. Hi, Laura. Uh, so Jennifer is a doctoral student at the School of Social Work at DU. Her research interests are centered around social innovations and inter interdisciplinary approaches to addressing poverty specifically the issue of homelessness. She's currently a graduate research assistant with the Center on Housing and Homelessness at DU. Previously, she was a fellow of the Barton Institute for Philanthropy and Social Enterprise. Her professional experience involves work with individuals and families experiencing homelessness, as well as adults with severe and persistent mental illness. Wilson holds a Master of Social Work and an MBA. And again, welcome and thanks for joining us, Jennifer. Thank you. We'll hear more about how you are not just in a social work program um, educationally, but you're working directly with architecture firms. Next, we have Chad Holsinger. Chad formed ShopWorks Architecture in 2012. The primary focus of the firm is urban infill development with a particular interest in affordable housing, transit-oriented and mixed-use development, and community-oriented projects. Chad has practiced architecture for more than 20 years and has been licensed in Colorado since 2001. His career has revolved primarily around affordable housing design mixed-use mixed development in the city of Denver. His unique multidisciplinary approach to design results in innovative, high-performing, enduring architecture. And anybody whose last name ends in Inger is okay with me. <laughs> and finally, Laura Rosbert. Laura is the COO at ShopWorks Architecture and oversees the internal systems at SW while also working on affordable housing projects to bring the ideals and values of trauma-informed design to life. Laura was the interim executive director and deputy director at the Dolores Project, a shelter for women and transgender individuals in Denver. She co-led the development of a royal village, which included a new homeless shelter, 35 units of supportive housing, and 95 units of workforce housing. She implemented trauma-informed care at Dolores while overseeing all internal operations and then external operations for her final year at the organization. And Laura, was, was that the one that won uh, the Mayor's Design Award? No, not yet. But uh, we're a finalist for the Jack Kemp ULI Award, so we feel right. pretty excited about that. Well, I know one of the winners last year had used some of the principles of trauma informed design, so it's good to see that, that we are leading the way here in Denver and Colorado. Uh, so without further ado, and to hear more about the good work that's happening here and how hopefully a lot of more firms can bring these practices into their um, internal and external audiences, we can turn it over to you. Thanks. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for having us. Um, and we really do believe that trauma-informed design, um, which we really like to talk about as really designing for resiliency and healing, um, is really communal. And there's information to be learned from everybody on this call. So we really do hope that you'll chat and this can be interactive. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about trauma. Um, that um, is really kind of the heart of our understanding and kind of the birth of this. And then Jennifer's going to share about our research project and what we found and how we found that out. Um, and then Chad's going to close us out with some great examples, giving 
um, how we've kind of taken this research and ideas and applied them to specific buildings. Um, just so you kind of know the flow of how that's gonna roll. So I'm gonna start with sharing my screen um, as we work to have this conversation. Um, so this whole uh, project was done in partnership with ShopWorks and Group 14 Engineering um, and the Center for Housing and Homelessness Research at DU. Uh, and Group 14 Engineering really brought their expertise in biophilia and other things to influence this. And I know they um, talked about maybe doing a future AIA uh, on that specifically. Uh, so that's why um, lovely friends at Group 14 Engineering are a part of this specifically. So this whole project was really um, birthed at Arroyo Village. Um, so when I was serving over there, helping to lead our development of this beautiful, glorious building, um, I was implementing what's called trauma-informed care in the shelter, in the programs. And trauma-informed care is really well-researched and evidence-based. Um, the SAMHSA, um, Center for Mental Health, you know, that oversees all of the United States in that, um, you know, has really some best practices that everywhere from, I mean, there was an article about how Denver Public Schools are implementing trauma-informed care. Um, this is thought of in hospitals and jails and therapist's office and kind of all of those pieces that help people heal. Uh, and so we were implementing that internally alongside um, our process for designing um, Arroyo Village, which was a partnership between the Dolores, part, uh, Dolores Project and Rocky Mountain Communities. And we invited the architects at ShopWorks um, to a training in trauma-informed care um, because we really wanted to make sure that how the programs were offered impacted the design of the building. Um, and as, as Chad will share, it, it kind of blew his mind, right? Um, that in all of these spaces, working with people experiencing homelessness, um, mental health is the priority for every single piece of design and it needs to be. And so then we went to do some research over, this is great, trauma-informed care is important. We're all around these same values of designing for healing and resiliency, um, which really is about creating safety and trustworthiness and peer support and collaboration and empowerment. And um, we didn't, we couldn't find a lot of research over how these ideas of trauma-informed design, trauma-informed care should impact the design. Um, and so when I headed off, when this project opened um, and I headed over to ShopWorks Architecture, uh, we started this big research project because we really wanted to hear um, and offer guidance for others so they didn't have the struggle that we did in designing supportive housing and affordable housing. So um, because I'm talking to a bunch of wonderful architects. Uh, I want to give a little bit of an overview of what we learned about trauma and how trauma impacts individuals um, very deeply. Um, and I can totally geek out over this, so I'm giving myself a time limit, I promise. Um, but trauma, when we talk about trauma-informed care and trauma-informed design, um, that, that comes from this Kaiser Permanente study that was done from 1995 to 1997. Um, and what they did is they developed this ACE score, Adverse Childhood Experiences, and gave it a rating of one to 10, right? And literally it's counting these things you see here up on the screen, right? Did this individual experience abuse as a child or neglect? Um, was there mental illness in the family? Was there substance abuse? Um, was there divorce? Um, and you literally count them. And then Kaiser did this study. And, and I wanna note, it's really important um, because I, I know this is focused on supportive housing because that's um, what ShopWorks does. Um, but when we talk about trauma, we're actually talking about all of us. Um, this study was done in a uh, middle-class um, suburb in California. And it noted that really most people have an ACE score. Um, it's really rare for somebody's score to be zero. Um, and so 64% of Americans have an ACE score of at least one, 16% um, have two, uh, 12 and a half have four or more. So this is really about how trauma impacts all of us. So what they found in this study um, was that 
when folks had these higher ACE scores, um, for example, if you have an ACE score of two, you're four times more likely to label yourself as an alcoholic. You're three times more likely to have attempted suicide. Um, for those who have an ACE score of four or more, you're more likely to consider, you're seven times more likely to consider yourself an alcoholic. Um, you're five times more likely to have experienced depression. Um, people with an ACE score of six or more died 20 years earlier on average than those without ACEs. And what was pretty striking about the research is that you can look at these things of what that trauma impact. That trauma did not just impact mental health, which I think makes sense to a lot of us. Um, but folks with higher ACE scores later in life had a higher um, probability of having broken bones, of developing cancer, um, stroke. Um, and so, um, so there's been a lot of research. Um, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, Harris is one of my heroes. She's this incredible doctor in California. Um, and she has this great TED talk that I'll, I'll throw in the chat. Um, but what, what she talks about is when children have this major childhood trauma, it literally rewires the systems in our body. It rewires your brain. Um, Raul Almazar at SAMHSA also talks about this. But when your body experiences that much stress on an ongoing basis, right, fight or flight, it keeps us alive when we encounter the bear in the woods. Um, but Dr. Dr. Nadine Burke Harris has this line where she says, but what happens when the bear comes home every single night? Um, so it's about your body constantly being in stress, your body constantly living or in fight or flight. Um, it inhibits the prefrontal cortex that's required for impulse control and executive functioning. Um, it shifts the pleasure and reward center in the, vein, in the brain um, and really deeply impacts that fear response uh, center. Um, and so, when you think about all of that, um, and you know, when we were designing this homeless shelter with folks who had really high ACE scores, um, it impacts their bodies and it impacts how they encounter every single human being they ever meet and the built environment. Um, and so one of the things I always sought to keep in mind um, is there was this study done um, by uh, Dr. Pan Panksepp, um, and noted that there was an experiment in which a tuft of cat hair was placed in a cage filled with playing mice. The mice stopped playing. Um, and when the hair was removed, the mice were observed to never again return to the same level of play. So for me, when we were making these design decisions, the question was, how do we avoid putting cat hairs in there, right? A cat hair has no ability to harm this mouse, right? Um, so, but the mouse has this automatic response and uh, folks who've experienced trauma, it's the same thing. You can put something in there that is 100% safe and logically you can explain to them why it's safe, but if it feels like a cat hair, it's gonna have them respond like a cat hair and not set them up for success. Um, and so we really wanted to take these concepts and think about how they should impact and inform um, what we design um, and, and how do we take this and, and get up beyond not just triggering people, but helping people heal, experience resiliency and joy. Um, and so I'm going to invite uh, Jennifer now to share about our research project. Yes, thank you. Um, so last spring and summer, uh, we, started what um, is an ongoing journey. I think we'll continue to research this topic and try to collect information, but, but we started a preliminary research project. Um, we identified three sites in Denver and Fort Collins um, that uh, had designed um, supportive housing with trauma in mind. Um, and we decided that we wanted to do focus groups in these buildings, largely with residents of the buildings um, who had experienced the trauma of homelessness, but also with staff. And so we um, conducted 11 focus groups in total at these three sites. Um, like I said, mostly with residents of the building. Um, and we also conducted I have 59 um, online, mostly quantitative surveys. We wanted to make sure that we were um, hearing from everyone, not just those who are participating in the focus groups. And I should also say we, um, we toured each of the buildings and 
the tours were given by those who um, lived in the building, residents of the building, and we had a chance to see um, their homes and have them describe the spaces sort of, um, you know, through their own lens. And so, um, Laura, if you could advance, we, um, we collected notes on all of these, um, the focus groups, the observations, the online surveys, um, and Jennifer, I think you can control the screen. Do you want to try that? Oh, look at that. Sorry. Um, nope. Amazing. Magic. Technology. <laughs> so, so we, um, we are, had all of this data. Um, there were folks from the university, from ShopWorks, from Group 14, um, a very interdisciplinary team, all um, sitting in on the focus groups, participating in the tours, and picking up on different, as you can imagine, different elements of what we were seeing and hearing. And so we just had piles and piles and piles of notes. And so um, I just want to speak very briefly about sort of our initial uh, analysis process and our goals for this data. So um, we took all of these notes and we began to synthesize and our objective was not to arrive at a checklist. I mean, you can imagine every person in the building is having a different experience with their apartment, with the amenity spaces, with um, aesthetically what they think I like, I don't like the exact same thing. Um, and so a checklist didn't seem like a really reasonable or feasible way to analyze the data, a one size fits all how to do trauma informed design. That's not what we were hearing, but really we were trying to think a little bit more broadly, sort of like 20,000 foot view about um, how people were talking about their experience of trauma as it relates to the building that they live in. So, um, gosh. There, there we go. So uh, the research team at the University of Denver at the Center for Housing and Homelessness Research, um, we tried to move towards something that felt like a framework, something that um, someone doing this work such as yourselves or um, anyone at the decision-making table, uh, a way to think about trauma and uh, trauma-informed design. And it was a very iterative process. We we combed through the qualitative data, the quantitative data, we worked with this team, and, um, and we kept saying, is this what we're hearing? Is this relevant? Does this make sense? Is this useful? And this is ultimately where we've landed for now. And like Laura said, this is an iterative process. This is uh, a journey. And so this is where we're at right now. This is our preliminary framework for trauma-informed design um, based on our research, which uh, is anchored in the experience of those living in the building who've had this experience of homelessness um, and also the staff who work there. And so um, what you see uh, in the center, these are our three C's, um, comfort, community, and choice, three C's of designing for, um, for health and dignity. Outside of those three C's are six values, um, core values that um, are intended to guide the process from start to finish and throughout. And then um, framing the, um, the model it are these three sort of contextual considerations, which um, are sort of big picture, but we felt we couldn't ignore um, as we're talking about these other elements. So I'm going to start in the center um, with the three C's of designing for health and healing. Um, we feel that these, um, the three C's are sort of at the heart of the decision-making process. Um, and like I said, they don't function, function as a checklist, but, um, but I think a helpful way to think about it is it's, it's sort of like a holistic mindset. Imagine um, taking on the three C's and in everything you do, everything you design, every decision you make, you consider how that decision impacts the comfort of the end user, the community and the way the community will or will not interact in that space, and also choice and whether or not there are opportunities for choice. Um, in each element. So uh, just to talk through these, I I'll probably spend the most of my time here. Um, comfort, we're talking about the quality of, of the various elements. We're talking about attention to aesthetics, to beauty. Um, the way that we heard this being discussed in the focus groups, um, some of it you, you know, may be able to easily imagine. People talked about how much they appreciated the colors of the walls. They were in these um, calming and appealing and sort of personalized to each floor perhaps hues that they um, they really enjoyed and appreciated 
um, they talked about natural elements being brought indoors. They loved um, one building, absolutely loved this fish tank. Um, they talked about wood versus plastic. Um, the fact that the quality of something communicated to them their value. And, um, and conversely, they talked about how cheap elements also communicated the fact that they didn't feel valued um, and they didn't feel terribly dignified living in this space. Um, they talked about beautiful artwork and how um, these felt like really um, sort of potentially like impractical investments, but that um, they so enjoyed and that were so beautiful. And, you know, uh, one building, there's this huge piece of beautiful artwork near the mailboxes and how um, it just, uh, it's such a, a surprising, unexpected detail that makes them feel so special every time they see it. Um, naturally, they talked a lot about light. And, you know, for folks who um, have experienced homelessness, as you can imagine, light and sleep are, um, they're, they're a major issue. And uh, you might not realize that a person doesn't often sleep with um, total darkness, that if you're in a shelter, um, you don't often have a pitch black sleeping space. Um, staff and volunteers need to be able to work in these environments and see what's going on. If you're in a gymnasium in a church, there are often these other light sources, exit lights and what have you, um, that, that places that you sleep may not always be dark. And uh, if you're on the streets, uh, even more so, people will often talk about the fact that they don't sleep at night, they sleep during the day so that they can stay awake and vigilant and safe at night. And so there's usually sleeping with uh, complete day, incomplete daylight. So um, the uh, ability to have the, you know, uh, comfortable sleep environment, total darkness, blackout shades, a dimmer switch, something that would allow them to achieve that level of comfort when they're sleeping um, was raised a lot during the focus groups. Um, and then another element that I thought was so interesting. So in one of the focus groups, we, we asked folks about their favorite places, the most comfortable places. And in one group, someone said, my couch. And then the entire group chimed in. Oh, I agree. I love my couch. These couches are amazing. These couches are the best. And, um, and you know, if you think about uh, the, the trauma of homelessness, the experience of homelessness, and, um, and the significance of the couch, it's sort of you know, it, it takes on a new meaning. Um, the living room is a place in the apartment where they could sort of see the lay of the land. You can see all the doors, all the windows, all entries, exits. Um, the couch is also, you know, usually right in front of the television. And if you can imagine being in a new environment that doesn't feel terribly secure, I just recently had someone call it the trauma of being housed after experiencing homelessness that that just because you have that door and that lock and that key, it doesn't automatically fix all of the traumas, the ins gross insecurities that you've experienced. Um, it's deeply unnerving and a lot of people don't know how to sit with it or it, it's a process for many. And so, um, so the couch is across from the TV and at night during the day, you can have some noise, some light, and it becomes another source of comfort. Um, in a new environment that's unsettling. And so the couch, this like small decision point takes on tremendous meaning for the person who lives there and was a deep sense of comfort for so many of the folks in that focus group. Um, so moving down the list, community, um, when our team, um, ShopWorks Group 14, the Center for Housing Homelessness Research, um, when we got together, we knew that you know, community and human connection was going to be a big part of this, but I don't think that we knew exactly how or the level of nuance involved. And so um, as we were um, moving through the data, we found that there were very distinct ways that people spoke about community. They talked about community internal to the building, and that was broken down into subcategories. They talked about community sort of external to the building. Internal to the building, some of the ways that we heard about this discussed really distinctly was the folks who you share a floor with. And this is um, your neighbors, you can smell what they're cooking, you can hear what they're saying, you do laundry with them, you throw away trash with them, you share maybe a TV room together. Um, so folks on your floor, then there were folks who you share an interest with. Um, these are people you garden with on the patio. These are people you smoke with out back. Um, these are people you play chess with downstairs. Um, and then staff in the building. And this was um, this was a really sort of critical relationship um, 
we heard over and over again how uh, it was so important for staff spaces to be near amenity spaces um, because people, it's not that they didn't want to meet one another, but there was this inherent initial um, distrust or uh, just being on guard and that they wanted to get to know one another within close proximity to staff. And um, so, so staff is present and you and I are feeling each other out. And once I know that you're my type of person and I can trust you, then I'll invite you to my apartment or maybe we'll like go hang out and play bingo. But uh, until then, I would like staff present while we're having that interaction because I don't know you and I don't know what you're about. And that's part of that trauma um, and that perceived safety. Um, and then outside the building, um, we, we again, you know, it, it wasn't just this sort of like blanket community um, uh, way of thinking about folks outside the building. It was guests who come in who you've invited in or who are there to see you. Um, it was those who live immediately around the building, mostly those who you could see from your window, really, um, but neighbors to the building. And then it was the rest of the city. Um, do I have access to you, bus routes and walking paths and um, cars and bikes and grocery stores? And so just really thinking about sort of the nuance of community and that uh, human connection, it was, again, not like a one size fits all. Um, and uh, if I can share just one more sort of um, story that we heard from the focus groups. One woman talked about um, interacting with her husband. He didn't live with her in the building, but he would come visit. She didn't want him in her apartment. She didn't want him in the building at all. She met with him outside the building out front. But um, she talked about the fact that they didn't have a place to sit. Um, there wasn't dedicated seating. Um, and so her and her husband, as they're working through what they're working through, would sit on the curb next to the sewer. And that's where they did um, their, their communicating and their, their tough work. And just thinking about sort of the built environment and the opportunity to make a decision about how a person might interact with someone just out front of the building, um, taking into consideration the fact that there might be a circumstance where someone has been through this trauma and they're estranged from their loved ones but they still wanna have like a safe way to interact with them that's just outside the building that feels safe. So, um, so it, it, it all, these are all sort of um, considerations for decision-making. And then, sorry not to belabor this one slide, but just to talk about choice. Um, when we talk about choice, we're talking obviously about you know, levels of engagement. I want to be around people, I want to be alone, um, but we're also talking about the opportunity to personalize a space. Um, one of the, the buildings gave um, residents an opportunity to choose their furniture, to choose the color of furniture that was moving into their unit. Um, just the opportunity to, um, to personalize in that like seemingly minor way. Um, and how all of that translates to this larger sense of agency and ownership and empowerment. We heard over and over again these themes of reinstitutionalization um, that, that uh, not having the choice to control light or heat felt like um, being incarcerated and having your environment totally dictated for you. We also heard themes about infantilization and treating people like children and, and how, um, you know, cubbies that were offered um, instead of like bars in a closet that they, they kind of felt like the cubbies in a kindergarten or a first grade classroom. Um, and just offering a person choice on multiple levels um, just helps them feel a sense of ownership over their, their space. And if I can just offer um, a couple examples that were so profound, I thought. Um, one was um, that folks, um, we were just doing focus groups in Boulder and folks talked about um, the fact that their kitchens didn't have ovens and that was um, you know, likely to, to keep people safe and um, just thinking about misuse or ways that an oven could um, hurt an individual or the building, um, but they talked about how um, how difficult it was not to be able to cook for themselves and how, again, the trauma of homelessness, this very specific experience, so often um, food is a major issue. You don't have refrigeration. Maybe you don't have access to food at all. Maybe you're at the mercy of whatever food you're given in whatever box or at whatever shelter, and so the ability to cook for yourself, to prepare food for yourself, but then like 
like thinking beyond that, the ability to share food with others, the ability to cook your family's recipes, the ability to celebrate your own cultural identity through food because it's not accessible here, um, and how sort of critical it is for a person to be able to have access to um, something like an oven because it, it means sort of agency and ownership in these much larger ways. Uh, and then secondly, um, and then I'll get off of this slide, um, something that was so fascinating, I thought, was um, you know, one of, I kept expecting in all of the tours, the folks who gave us the tours, they were residents of the building and they could tell us about the different types of units. My unit has a larger living room and a smaller bedroom. My neighbors has a larger bedroom and a smaller living room. I have five windows, they have six windows, the corners have seven, whatever. They knew about sort of the, the lay of the entire building, everyone seemed to. And I kept pr like probing and waiting for someone to say, it's not fair. Every unit should have the same number of windows. Every unit should be the same because it's not fair. But it was uh, not once did I hear that perspective. Over and over again, it was, I appreciate the variety, like variety is the spice of life kind of thing. I appreciate that I can have an environment that's personalized to me. I like to entertain, so I need a larger living room, but um, so-and-so spends a, a lot of time in her bedroom. Maybe she's like more bed bound, and so she needs a larger bedroom. And there was just this acute awareness of the fact that we don't all need or want the same thing, so a building shouldn't be designed that way, and a real appreciation for variety. I think that that speaks to the comfort, the community, and the choice perfectly. Um, so moving on. Oh. Moving on from the three C's, I, I nearly broke the whole thing, um, are the six core values. And so I just wanna provide, they're pretty self-explanatory um, and especially based on um, sort of some of the examples from the research. But um, I wanna provide some background information. Jill Pable is one of um, the, the leading experts in this area of trauma-informed design and the built environment specifically for folks who have experienced homelessness. And um, she is faculty at Florida State University, works in interior design, interior architecture and design. Uh, she has a list of six qualities separate from these six values. She calls them six human qualities that most people desire for physical and mental health in the places they inhabit, which is a mouthful. Um, and then, so we looked at those six and we thought these are interesting. And then Chad with ShopWorks, um, uh, based on his several decades of work in this area, had listed like a dirty dozen of key considerations in this work to promote healing and dignity and joy. And so uh, we looked at Joe Pable's six and Chad's dozen, and we um, attempted to sort of synthesize these lists from experts in this area. And we arrived at these six core values, um, the, the best of the best. And again, the values, um, this is sort of a guiding light and it starts at the very inception of a project and it moves all the way through and then they become sort of the ideally the the um, the the ar arrival point for everyone who lives there and around there um, that everyone would be able to um, live out these values and achieve these values in in the place that they live um, and so just to go through them um, these are sort of abridged versions but when we're talking about hope, we're talking about hope and dignity and self-esteem, connection and community. I'm just gonna move around the circle. Joy, beauty and meaning, um, the bottom peace of mind. Um, how is my time? I'll, I'll, I'll keep moving. I have some more examples if it comes up in the Q&A. Um, safety, security and privacy. And again, just to say that um, we really want to acknowledge both um, real, safety and also perceived safety. This is the tuft of hair um, that Laura talked about in terms of trauma and triggers. Um, so real and perceived safety and security. Um, and then empowerment and personal control. And, um, and so finally, I'll just go to the outside of the framework and here are the contextual considerations um, that we feel we would be remiss to not mention or um, acknowledge that you have to consider in the decision-making process. And so at the top right, we have, whoop. Um, oh, well, I I'll talk you through them. Uh, at the top right is the environmental context. And here we're not just talking about the physical environment. I mean, we are as well, the geography and the climate, but also 
a political environment, an economic environment, um, a, 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 several considerations, um, systems and institutions that are in place that a person operates within um, and that uh, a building or um, um, an organization operates within. At the bottom, we have the cultural context, and this is this is um, obviously the culture of a place, tradition, memory, history, um, the identity of a people who live there, who have lived there, um, and then finally the lived experience. Um, with we really want to highlight the experience of those who live in the building and really legitimizing and listening to that experience again from the very beginning of a project um, until the very end and and trusting and believing that um, a person has had an experience and knows what um, how they're perceiving the world how they believe the world is perceiving them and what they need um, but i also want to raise that um, it's also important to understand the lived experience of sort of all the stakeholders on a project and you know um, Laura uh, at ShopWorks is quick to identify the fact that she has always been housed. And even though she does this housing work and has worked with folks experiencing homelessness, as a person who's always been housed, that lived experience, it, 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 it informs every, the way we see the world, the decisions we make, what we value. And so just acknowledging the lived experience of all parties involved as well and the way that it, um, it informs how we see the world. So that is our preliminary framework, um, and I'll hand it over to Chad at this point. Cool. Thanks, Jennifer. And I think what Jennifer and Laura are really talking about is a process. There's, there goes Pecha Kucha. Um, <laughs> but uh, we really think it's important uh, in in, in the very inception of a project to get to know uh, who, who's to be housed, who's operating the building, what, what's the neighborhood, and what are the values of those places, um, so that that can manifest itself into the, the very basic design ideas that you can't get back once you get down the road a ways. Um, let's see if I can operate the slides here. Perfect. Um, so I think architects are usually pretty good at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom two rungs, safety needs, phys physiological needs. Um, what we're really talking about is trying to figure out how to engage with these um, higher notches on the uh, hierarchy. You know, what is it that the built environment can do to promote love and belonging or, or to discourage it? Um, how does the built environment create uh, opportunities for folks to gain self-esteem, um, strength and freedom, um, especially when uh, that's a luxury that they haven't really engaged with in some time. And, and obviously self-actualization, self I think uh, that's kind of a lofty agenda, but I think it's uh, not impossible to think that if we do buildings and cities with these kinds of values in mind, uh, we get outcomes that are a little bit more uh, dignified. Um, we love projects that have a mixed use. Um, this is a project in West Denver called Terraza del Sol, and it was a 42 unit uh, affordable housing development. But on the ground floor, uh, the developer of the um, building um, struck a partnership with Mikasa Resource Center which was an institution that was serving low-income low families and doing job training and, uh, and banking skills, tax night, stuff like that. Um, and that was incorporated into the, the program of the building, the, the physical um, organization of the building. And what's really cool about that is that it's kind of an instant neighborhood and it's all, it also an instant 24 hour seven days a week neighborhood because there's always something going on, uh, whether it's events at Mikasa or things going on in the residential community. And so the vibrancy of uh, the mixed use really makes a place for the people who live there. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, understanding the values of the people in a place and, um, and art I think is one way that really captures uh, 
that core value. And um, attaching symbolic meaning into architecture is a really potent and cool and powerful thing. And it really creates endearing places that people are willing to defend and to uh, maintain safety and um, remain close to. So this is, this is the uh, interior architecture of the Mikasa suite. Um, and they found an artist within their community and, and they worked with some of the, the folks that they're serving and came up with these uh, beautiful murals within the boardroom and uh, thinking about transparency, transparency in the boardroom, stuff like that. I also think that the entry is an important feature of uh, urban buildings and um, doing things that create a little bit of a soft landing into the building um, so that folks have the opportunity to, to unpeel thresholds into um, into a building they've never been in especially. Um, and so they can take it a single step at a time. Um, also the, uh, even though a lot of times the buildings we're designing are large, we're trying to figure out how to connect them into neighborhoods. Um, so in this, this particular instance, uh, a project in Globeville, um, we heard in the neighborhood that, you know, we think we're a bunch of little cottage like bungalows and um, you know can we not do a big rectangular uh, boxy apartment building what can we do that speaks our language um, so again uh, thinking about those kinds of ideas coupled with art coupled with the way the building looks on the street um, and identifying an entrance one of the uh, aha moments the uh, you know the stupid architect thing is uh, laundry rooms. You know, folks who've experienced homelessness, as Jennifer was saying, um, around food, that's really hard, but so is laundry. And um, laundry is a place where you might have all your possessions in a washing machine for some period of time. And you may be asked to leave them there while the load runs. And um, so uh, we've been doing projects lately where, uh, we've kind of coined the term the laundry spa, um, slight exaggeration, but, but the concept's cool. Like this one's a, a fitness center. Um, we've done, done them where it's more of a lounge type setting. Um, but the idea here is that you could join a friend or a family member um, and stay near your belongings um, and have a dignified place to uh, clean your clothes. This is a really cool little project at like Third and Broadway. Um, it's called the Silver Lining House. It's, um, it's transitional housing for homeless teenagers um, operated by the Providence Network. And um, this one was really special to us. It, the, uh, we took an old mansion and, and really turned it into a home where families live with homeless youth. And, uh, and can you even imagine like walking into this uh, from homelessness as a kid and um, being welcomed into a community like this? And, uh, they had a board member uh, who found all this furnishings and um, I mean, she just had a great eye for it and uh, made it a passion project to furnish this house that we just didn't mess up uh, really beautifully and, um, and turn it into something warm, welcoming and, um, and a place where youth can connect in meaningful ways so that when they leave this place, no matter what's going on in their personal or family life, they do have connections um, to other individuals uh, from this community. Right before this call, we, uh, we had a, a, what do you call it, a FaceTime with um, our client for this project. It's a uh, old movie theater in Fort Collins that we're converting into a supportive housing project. And it's one of the, the greatest zoning capers of all time where we, we called it a remodel. Um, but what it actually is, is housing for homeless. And, um, and in the middle of this, because it's a big square windowless building, um, we were able to fit in a giant atrium. Um, in addition to cutting in windows and things that seem a little more appropriate and humane uh, for places for people to live. Um, we're also trying to integrate ideas around landscape and um, urbanism 
and connect with uh, colors and smells and bugs and things like that that really um, constitute what it is to live in a place. And, uh, and along the, the SAMHSA research line, um, smells and colors uh, actually are, uh, are methods of de-stressing uh, people who are um, in trauma. This is the atrium that, that uh, we saw on FaceTime and it's finally framed and uh, hopefully one of these days we'll report some real photos of it. But, uh, but within this community, there's places for the residents to uh, congregate and uh, have uh, personal dis uh, relationships and maybe even bigger uh, group celebrations and things like that um, spilling in. This is a cool project in um, Aurora called Providence at the Heights. It's operated by the Second Chance Center um, and they house folks coming out of prison. Um, and this was not the greatest zoning caper of all time. In fact, we got a unanimous denial <laughs> from the Planning Commission um, for the project, which we ultimately appealed successfully, but uh, very stressful, um, very controversial. Um, but it's really special what they're doing um, and bringing, bringing folks from uh, prison back into housing and into society in a dignified way. Um, the architecture of this, our client was like, we just want it to look like it's emerging from the landscape. And West Holgate Creek is over to the right of the image and, and it's a riparian area and it's got these dogwoods and uh, 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 cottonwood trees and stuff like that and all these animals and stuff coming through. And the color palette was really warm. And so we, we, used, we used the idea of like, what's, what's a warm color palette and, um, and then the kind of water cutting through there. Um, to ground the building. Um, and I don't know uh, if you remember this night in June, but our photographer was there and um, there was all this lightning. It was pretty amazing. I don't know how that happened. Um, on the inside, we're also thinking about authentic materials, wood and masonry, um, concrete. You know, Jennifer talked about plastics and quality of, of touch. Um, and to design for folks who, uh, for healing, I think it's really important to uh, be humble, but I think also authentic with respect to the palette choices that are made and, and the method of that. This isn't a housing project. It's kind of a weird school we designed uh, for Laredin. It's a school with, uh, that serves kids with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, in Globeville. And, um, before we started working on this, they operated the school in two buildings. Um, both were tile factories. Laredin used to make tiles with uh, folks with intellectual disabilities um, and sell them around the state. And, and there's, built, there's really actually famous buildings all around the state of Colorado with uh, Laredin tiles made by these kids and young adults. Um, but as you can imagine, a tile factory and a school aren't really synonyms, and but they were operating that way, and so it was noisy and dark and um, and not really well appointed. And so, our architectural idea to help ease the situation was to put a metal building right in between it, the cheapest one we could find in a catalog, um, and then do stuff on the inside to um, soften the sound. Um, and create um, authentic materials again, you know? And so instead of CMU walls, we, we chose to uh, use plywood um, as a wainscot and uh, acoustical baffles. It was a DIY project we kind of imposed on the general contractor, you know, the, the uh, furniture systems people have great, beautiful versions of this, but uh, we did a 25,000, square foot school on a $3 million budget. So we weren't gonna get to go there. So we bought a couple of rolls of felt and, and uh, tricked the contractor into hanging them up. What, one thing I will mention about this, and, and for anybody who's interested in statistics, the, uh, the youth outbreak uh, numbers uh, after they moved in and got settled uh, dropped precipitously as did staff retention at the school. Um, so both metrics had a massive, you know, 20-ish percent increase or decrease. Um, 
type of a, an effect on how folks were living in, in that in that kind of a space. Um, the question of memory is one that I'm always really interested in, and and the Dolores Project, uh, one of their traditions uh, when a guest joined the shelter uh, was they ha had an army of volunteers that made these quilts and they would offer a, a guest a quilt when they were welcomed into the shelter community. And when we were designing the Arroyo Village project, we were wondering like, gosh, there are so many competing factors on this project. You know, there's 30 feet of grade and there's water quality problems and there's a light rail thing over there and a giant water line that we got to miss. And we were eroding our budget at a precipitous pace. So it was like hard to, hard to do muscular architectural ideas. Um, but then we thought, well, why don't we make the building kind of a, an abstraction of a quilt? And, and with that, like let that just be the architecture and the meaning of the architecture. Um, and also connect the residents of the shelter and of the housing community into a narrative that's kind of uniting. Additionally, the very first thing residents of the shelter see is this, this is the lobby. Um, it, there's no white linoleum and bug filled uh, fluorescent lights and stuff like that. That It's soft seating. Um, a, a staff member behind the glass comes out to greet an individual. They can see out a door. They can, um, so there's no feeling of being trapped or coerced into the environment. And the environment is actually um, calming. You can see rocking chairs. Rocking is another great, great method uh, to deescalate stress. Then this is Phyllis's first day uh, getting the tour from Laura, one of Laura's favorite pictures. We do a little bit of work with Volunteers of America too, and one of their one of their great ideas, I think, is permanence. They they think that there's this idea about dignity that we're not going to leave and go away, and um, they found with their clientele that um, they've lost relationships or lost their homes or um, lost their jobs. And, and that's a theme in their life. And so the architecture of VOA is something that's like uh, permanent and dignified and, um, and kind of with stature. Um, so this is a building that opened about six months ago in West Denver, kind of by Sloan's Lake. Um, the CEO of VOA Colorado, uh, when we started the project, took me up to an old hospital that was on the site. And um, we looked over Sloan's Lake and she said, you know what, I wanna make sure that all of our residents have this view of Sloan's Lake, kind of like we're standing and enjoying here. And um, so that's that great room up on the top. The ability to create uh, interconnected spaces is important too, though. I think, um, you know, this project was uh, organized in such a way where small, small groups could sidle on to large groups. So if you weren't feeling like extroverted enough and to have the courage to step into the bigger place, you could kind of seek to participate in the community, but not be like in the center of it. And so we're always looking for ways to kind of overlap ripples and puddles of space uh, in such a way that folks have agency over where they choose to be. Last project I'll share with you is uh, this one's almost completed in construction. It's uh, for Karis in Grand Junction. And Karis is a, an organization that works with homeless youth also. And, um, you know, their idea of, uh, of architectural expression and of place was like, we need something with adrenaline and um, we need something that really inspires kids and captures their imagination and, and creates a sense of hope in uh in their future and so uh we really took the challenge of that to say well what what would that mean in an architectural expression and and um, so we wanted to do something that was kind of playful and um, vigorous as you walk up into it and then um and then kind of of the environment with the colors and tones you know the the great bluffs and uh sandstone cliffs that uh, adorn Grand Junction were kind of our color palette. But also the interior environment, the very first impression a youth has when they walk in is like, wow, what a great place. And, and again, you can kind of see how there's layers of space that um, allow for various levels of uh, 
social interaction without having to maybe participate in the in a big group or or find a way to sidle off to the side but still uh, participate in community so anyway that's kind of like a uh a, a whirlwind tour through what we've been thinking about for the last uh three or four years really um starting with the aha moment at uh the dolores project um when we recognize that there is there is something to this idea that when folks experience chronic stress for um, a long enough period of time that their brain ceases to develop in normal ways and um, and we really feel like there's a way for architecture to participate in the reconnecting of that brain uh, healing and uh, provide place for that to happen in a in a really amazing way so with that I'm done I, I think I'll leave it to Mike or all right oh, there's questions yeah um, well, and just a, can I Mike I just two quick slides um two I think for us two folks have asked like how do we know if a building is trauma informed um and for us you know the heart of our research was asking those with lived experience um, we were going to have a resident of the Dolores Apartments join us for this in COVID and stuff anyway, did not allow that to happen. Um, but for us too, we really want to think about kind of how we also continue these conversations and do more evidence-based research. Um, you know, we focused on supportive housing here, but what does this look like as it applies to a whole number of um, items? Um, so anyway, lots of conversations for the future for this project. That's great. We'll leave this slide up for a while. Um, we're, I've got some questions for you, but while people are thinking of their own, we're going to do things a little bit differently today. Um, if you can either type your question in the Q&A as usual, or if you'd like to use the raise hand feature um, and unmute your video, we can have you um, interact directly and see your, your smiling face as you ask your question. So um, I just want to say very informative, great um, Great case studies and, you know, institutional is not one of the 10 or even first 20 words you would use to describe any of these projects as you, as you look at the project images and um, it's clear that that's intentional. Um, yeah, one of, one of the thoughts that, uh, and, and this is a controversial thought actually um, with a, a lot of our clients, but some of our clients designed for 1% of their people and and that could be the suicide risk or somebody with a violent outburst burst or whatever and and that's how you end up with institutional looking buildings is that you know that hole in the wall and then the facilities people start saying well we don't like holes in the wall um, maybe they should be made out of concrete and and we lose sight of the fact that this is actually where people live and it, it should have some dignity so instead we try to favor people and uh, over over that one percent yeah it's a it's a version of lowest common denominator based design except it's it's more about what's the greatest risk and let's design all the space around that when it really could be a targeted solution that you're looking for that's right it's a really good takeaway too i think that trauma is not episodic i think people think of it as a one and done thing mm -hmm. uh, or maybe if it's a little bit worse you might have um a, a lingering problem like PTSD and you can just go to therapy and deal with it and move on. But it really is a lasting condition that influences your life from that point forward. Um, and I guess I want to ask um, Jennifer, had, had you or any of your colleagues made this connection before to the design environment um, and its influence on, on how people experience trauma and recovery? It's so funny that you say that because I think I constantly reflect on the fact that um, maybe it's an inflated sense of capacity or capability, but I think I every shelter that I've worked in, every program that I've worked in, every um, case management or program management role I've ever had, I have always attributed anything that we can do with a person or a family or a community um, 100% to 
the abilities of the staff, the social workers, the team to um, think through a problem, to offer a human being a right to self-determination and to craft and, and problem solve their own destiny, to um, giving them all the resources, to delivering services in just the right way. I talk a lot about programming in like a social work sense that you can build an environment, but if the staff doesn't understand and doesn't create like staffing or um, organizational programming that, you know, works with the building, like one focus group talked about computer, the computer lab was so helpful, but the printer was in the staff space. And so they'd have to ask the staff to, they could print things and to retrieve those things and the room was locked. And so they couldn't use the space unless staff made it possible. Um, all of that to say, no, I don't think I really appreciated. Um, one of the shelters I managed, we had all um, like inflatable mattresses because of a bed bug outbreak so many years ago. And, um, and as a result, everyone basically slept on these deflated, horrible beds every night at the shelter. And it just, it, yes, it was totally like designed for the chance that there will be this bed bug outbreak eventually. And so, no, I'm ashamed that I didn't think more about the environment that we were in. I think staff ex sort of accepted um, where we were as a constraint that we had to work with and there was nothing we could do about it. So how could we think through it in a pro with a programming lens? Sure. Um, There's a boatload of regulations and requirements that you got to follow, you know, from, from funders and government and, and just staffing administrative needs that it, it's not top of mind for, for any administrator or staff member. So that's where the architects come in and say, hey, we, we, we don't want to manage a shelter, but we can help you design it better so that you don't deal with a lot of these other problems of staffing and, and, and outbreaks and things like that. So yeah, yeah. I'm fascinated that there's this whole um, field of exploration to be done here um, that will yield huge benefits for everybody involved. We got a question from somebody named Emily Waldinger. Um, for ShopWorks, have you conducted post-occupancy surveys for any of the projects shown today? If so, how did you collect feedback and data and how have residents responded to these trauma-informed design methods? That's a, that's a three for one there. Yeah, let's go for it, Laura. Um, yeah, that's actually a huge piece for us. I mean, because it's through that post occupancy work that we realized where we were idiots, frankly, right? Like, you know, like trash rooms being triggering, duh, like duh, for folks who've experienced homelessness and their stuff are often swept away by the Denver police, duh, trash rooms are triggering, right? Um, come on, let's have some higher level thoughts. How do we make them more dignified? Um, and so we do that through a number of things. I mean, so now, I mean, on all of our projects, we actually do um, conversations in advance. So we talk to, um, like, for example, in Boulder, we're working on a supportive housing project. So we interviewed the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless uh, guests and staff. Uh, Lee Hill, which is a PSH up in Boulder, we did a post-occupancy study there with um, staff and uh, residents, um, you know, and then talk to people in the broader community as well. Um, and so for us, I mean, for each of those post-occupancy studies that we do, you know, we learn new things. Um, we're lucky to have this great relationship with the Center for Housing and Homelessness Research. Um, so uh, sometimes I do that since I have, um, you know, experience working in programs and shelters and kind of know how to de-escalate situations should they arise, right? Um, you know, because uh, architects get a little nervous when somebody's like threatening death. In, to another person um, in our interviews. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's just Monday. Like we're just, you know, this is how we roll. Um, you know, so we work with uh, Jennifer and her team um, to really come up with both questions that ask kind of the nitty gritty, is this working for you, is this not? But then also how we get to those higher level values because trauma-informed design is about kind of elevating our thought about every single thing we're designing. Um, so really talking to folks about what feels healing, what doesn't, why are they a part of the communities they're a part of? Um, so that we can make sure we're adding that meaning and that identity to all of these buildings. Um, and then also kind of checking ourselves saying, did we do that? We had these goals, did we reach it? Um, you know, and working to ask kind of a whole variety of questions um, to make sure we're learning those lessons um, and getting to those higher level of thoughts and also kind of those basics like, 
is there a color in here that you hate that's super triggering, right? Um, for example. And I'm, o I'm always happy if folks want copies of any of those questions, um, let me know. I'm super happy to kind of give you, um, to have a one-off conversation over what that looks like for any specific building. Are the questions mostly standard, like 80% are the same for each project? Mm -hmm. 20 are adapted to that particular yeah, I Yeah, I'd say 60% are kind of standard and then 40% um, kind of dive deeper on kind of specific architecture features that are either hoped for, um, specific spaces we're designing, right? So trauma-informed design is all about the identity of the folks who are moving in deeply impacts the design, right? So when we're doing for seniors, that might look different than folks who are leaving incarceration. Um, so I think there are those, and then really getting to that neighborhood, that cultural context, those identities that folks are bringing to the space as well, um, those ones tend to be really specific. And it's also a lot of kind of open-ended questions as well um, to really allow folks to show up. And what do you find is the best time frame after the fact to, to go into the field and ask those surveys? Obviously, I mean, our, um, yeah. lived experience in the, in the thing, but you don't want to be so soon that they haven't really experienced everything about it. I mean, we were just having this conversation with our research team last week. I mean, in an, our ideal world, it's like six months, a year, two years, three years, five years, and 10 years, yeah. um, you know, for this to really be done well. Um, the thing is also supportive housing hasn't existed in Colorado for very long. Um, it's a newer concept. Transitional housing used to be the thing. And then intelligent people realized, wow, constantly people having a date they're going to move out just keeps them in drama because they're just focusing on where they're moving next. Like, not rocket science, but rocket science. Um, you know, so I think for us, we did some of these like six months after the spot. Um, and that provided some really helpful things of seeing kind of what healing had happened and was possible. Yeah. You don't get that longitudinal data as easily with this kind of clientele though, because there is a fair number of uh, turnover and transition too, so. Yeah, the thing about permanent supportive housing though is the goal is that folks stay in kind of for the rest of their lives. So actually the division of housing, how they rank, um, is, is the least number of kind of evictions or folks leaving. Because um, supportive housing in Colorado really does target those folks who don't need to be in assisted living, but for them to stay stable in housing, they really need that ongoing case management and support. Um, but trying to be in touch with them because their cell phone number changes every month, I mean, that's also the problem, <laughs> so. What a concept, measuring success by how long you can get people to stay versus how many you can serve and, and yep. push. Yep. Uh, so if we've got another question or editorial comment, you can edit, you can take that out of the, the curated video later. Uh, Jennifer Ramsey asks, what are thoughts on the Denver inclusive zoning debate, specifically transitional housing forms in traditional single family neighborhoods and ability to apply this research and precedent to address existing neighborhood fear and bias? Uh, this is the, um, the, the usual NIMBY argument. Yeah. Mm. It's, uh, um, well, go ahead. Well, please, please, Chad. My two cents on it is that uh, zoning codes prohibit options. They don't um, create great options, kind of by definition. And uh, so whatever Denver can do to ease ordinance language to permit uh, folks to be housed legally in, in any method possible, I think just creates options. Uh, and allows for folks to not find themselves homeless, actually. Um, so I think that's, generically speaking, the most important step um, and, and, an, and an affirmative challenge that they've got to, and they're taking on. I, I don't know if it'll work or not. I'm hopeful. Um, but uh, simultaneous to, to that, we are actually doing a lot of tangent research to um, to trauma-informed design, which has to do with property values near housing um, of homeless folks or near shelters, um, parking ratios uh, that might be expected in, in uh, buildings that are designed for folks or, or living at a poverty level, things like that. Um, in order to give uh, zoning ordinance a little bit more flavor for what actually it is to house people who, who might not otherwise be housed. And, um, 
and right now, uh, Denver's, Denver's trying pretty hard actually to get it right. But it, everything that we're doing seems to be like so new to everybody. Neighborhoods don't understand uh, what permanent supportive housing is. It's like halfway houses. Is that what we're talking about? Well, no, we're actually talking about apartments. Um, but so there's there's fear at that level, and then um, then the zoning and and planning staff don't really have a have a deep nuanced understanding, um, and then it all interlocks with. Uh, financing uh, language it's really unfortunate so like on one end you'll apply for a grant that says some words that the zoning code prohibits um, so it's really kind of a tricky time um, in in housing and in in homelessness um, regarding how it's regulated and and um, and kind of easing the tensions of of folks who are concerned about what it really is and the impact it will have on them, rightfully so. But uh, but but curating enough data that's uh, credible enough to say that you know housing for everybody is good for any neighborhood. It's just that simple. Yeah, you you mentioned last time we talked, Chad, about how some cities have actually studied this and that you know the red herring of you know our property values are going to go down if you bring this here is not necessarily true. Yeah, um, Trulia did a study, uh, it's four or five years old now, um, around affordable housing. It, it didn't have anything to do with homeless serving housing, um, but that the property values uh, were no worse than par on any other type of development that would have happened next door. So um, there is some evidence there, there's, there's not nearly enough, I think, uh, I don't know how to engage others in creating some data sets like the Realtor Association or somebody like that. It'd be great if, if we could find somebody like that who could lend some credence to these theories, what, what, what we believe to be true. And, and certainly developments we've done 10 years ago uh, never seemed to have an effect on the neighborhood in any other way but positive. You know, that it, it, it filled an empty site, it, gets people living in the city and using the infrastructure and connected to the amenities nearby and that's what a city should be and as you produce more of these projects it's going to be easier to combat some of those preconceptions that people have in their minds about what supportive housing is or, or homeless transition housing whatever they they call it in their own minds you know if you get if you get the scale right if it's actually beautiful and looks intentional and not like a government you know, housing block or, or a, a glorified prison cell, um, people will be like, and eh, that's not going to be so bad. I like having that down the street or around the corner. And then I'm, I'm thinking, Jennifer, about those, those three core principles and the six values. If you get, if the design team gets things like comfort right, they're not going to have people sitting on the curb next to the sewer to have their arguments or they won't want to get the hell out of the building because it's so ugly to wander the neighborhood. Right. Right. Yeah. The, the three C's, I don't think I said, but I mean, in the most obvious ways they're overlapping. And I think that if you deeply consider one in your decision-making, I think that you achieve elements of the others um, because you've just thought about a human experience and what a person needs and the fact that everybody needs something maybe a little bit different. But, um, but just like that variety and choice, I think, allows for comfort and for community to foster in a natural way. So I, it, none of it is rocket science, um, but it, it is, I think it is just adopting a way of thinking about this work. And I think um, Chad and Laura will talk about how every ShopWorks project at this point, this has become a natural part of the conversation. It's woven into every single thing they do. It, it, isn't, it isn't this totally separate trauma-informed checklist that they're making sure that they've achieved. It's uh, we just think about people and everything we do. Um, and if, if I can, I wanna be mindful of time, but I, I do wanna just speak to the like nimbyism of the, the previous question. Um, I am working on a research project with 
uh, beloved community village, Denver's first tiny home village for folks experiencing homelessness, and now they're opening a second. We conducted one evaluation in 2017-18. We're conducting another evaluation 2019-20. We're wrapping it up right now, and we're analyzing all the findings. And it has been interesting. We've spoken to the neighbors, a random sample of neighbors in both of the, the neighborhoods where the village was um, then and now. And we, we continue to feel, um, to hypothesize that we're going to hear all of this like really heavy, not in my backyard sentiment. And in reality, I mean, this latest move to Globeville has been contentious and delicate. And we have given neighbors umpteen opportunities to say, I hate them and I don't want them here. They're not good people. They make a mess. They're noisy. They're unsafe. And uh, what we continue to hear and like uh, over time is, is that actually I'm at pretty okay with them. I, I don't really know them, but they're quiet and they mind their own business. They're like literally most other neighbors on this block. Um, I'm neutral about their existence. What I don't appreciate was a process the city doing something to us without us having say or being heard and I'm still not over that and maybe I don't like the project because of that and I'll never be okay with the project because of that or I'm coming around but it has nothing to do with the people or the mission of the agency so I think that that has been an interesting finding really corroborated by our quantitative and qualitative data and so something to consider that um, again the people of the neighborhood have their own trauma and history and experience and they want to be heard and they want their needs to be understood. And so um, that's a huge undertaking to hear from the neighborhood. Uh, I totally appreciate that. Um, but just that's what we're hearing with the tiny home project. Well, that tells me there's a community engagement piece that it's not just the, the future clients and users of the project, it's the, the neighbors uh, surrounding that project as well. Right. Yep, absolutely. Um, thanks for, for being uh, mindful of the time and, and our folks aren't shy if they need to go somewhere else, they're, they're free to leave at any point in time. But just a couple more questions to kind of round this out. Um, I'm really curious, Laura, your transition from client of a firm to COO of a firm, if you could let us know how that happened, other than the fact that Chad's a charming guy and they do great work. <laughs> Uh, it was pretty funny. I definitely got some pushback from the board of directors of Dolores when I was like, hey, uh, I'm going to go work at Shopworks. And they're like, you're going to go work for a for-profit corporation? You've sold out. I was like, have you met Shopworks? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was a crazy idea. I threw it, Chad. Uh, drinks might have been involved, I'm not going to lie. Um, and he didn't say no when I was like, can I come work at Shopworks? Um, and it's been really fun because I think, you know, one of the things that I realized is that Architects think a certain way and nonprofit leaders think a certain way and live in, I always, I, I love nonprofits. I was a part of nonprofits my whole career until I joined Shopworks. Um, and and um, nonprofit leaders tend to work in this mindset of scarcity. Um, you know, at Dolores, our plumbing never worked. There's never enough funds to do everything you wanna do. You come up with a great idea, you have to apply for a grant. Maybe 18 months later, you get to implement the amazing idea you had that's now old and, but you got to do it because you have grand deliverables, right? Um, you know, so I sit at these design tables and I hear nonprofit leaders saying to Shopworks architects, yeah, that's fine. And the architect's like, great, it's fine moving forward. And I'm like, no, no, pause. We don't want fine, right? Like we want extremely happy, you know? And so I think there's this translation. Um, and because I have sat around, you know, the design tables, I can really um, help with that process. Um, you know, and as we noted, I mean, NIMBYism um, really tries to kill every project. And I also bring a history as a community organizer. Um, and I mean, who knew my like, you know, history and politics would be so helpful for architecture. <laughs> um, you know, so it's been really fun um, to really be able to kind of bring these ideas um, kind of across the firm. Um, and also look at where projects get beat up. You know, parking is one of them, you know? So, you know, I'm working on a parking study that notes in affordable housing in Denver, specifically supportive housing, 7% of residents have cars, 7%. Um, you know, that's completely against what code requires, you know? So how do we work to kind of shift this 
to allow kind of us to impact our community um, in these ways. So, uh, so it's been fun. And I mean, I think our architects are the most amazing people um, in this town. And so it's really fun to kind of get to sit at the tables and learn and kind of push every project to those higher ideals that we all strive for. Yeah, and, and for the record, Chad, you do hire architects. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have architects too. Yeah. But I, I, if you could comment just as we, as we look toward wrapping up here, um, when we usually talk about in the industry multidisciplinary um, collaboration, it's engineers, planners, <laughs> um, surveyors, contractors. This is a whole different level of multidisciplinary. Right? So how has that helped your firm do better work? Well, I mean, I think uh, we're thinking more broadly about a lot more relevant things, actually. I think, you know, planning and urbanism and architecture, uh, I think have gotten self-referential. Um, and what, uh, including uh, health and human services types of ideas into the dialogue really says that uh, people live here too. And, you know, so we should be designing for that idea. Um, and restoring connections is a big part of that. You know, if we get away from vehicular uh, hegemony and into something that's a little bit more like for people, um, that that would actually do more to address homelessness than any one thing, I think. Um, I have no research to prove that. Jennifer's gagging right now, but um, but I think that's true. Like, if if people have ways to connect that are authentic and and ways to find safety within their community, um, those networks create the safety net that's missing right now, and and um, so reordering our prioritization of uh, ideals and ideas is is kind of what this is about. And, and Jennifer has been a really great sport. I think she's endured some things that are a little bit uncomfortable for her maybe in, in the pinheaded architect crowd. But, um, but it is really great to kind of see the world through her lens and through Laura's lens and others uh, of our clients because um, they teach us a lot of things that are just unbelievable that are happening, you know, and, and I'm naive. I'm, I'm continually pr proven to be naive. I'm not sure everybody's buying that after today, um, but we appreciate your humility. And uh, I, I just think this is a great process that is, that is unfolded for, for these projects. And, and it's certainly not something that's limited to just one firm or one project type. So um, you guys have a bit of a 4D model here. You discovered, you designed, you documented, and, and you're distributing through this conversation. So I know there's a publication. Um, I'll let you guys talk about that as we wrap up, um, if anybody on the call is able to access that. Yeah, I'll put um, a link in the chat. But if you go to ShopWorks Architecture um, and you go to our projects, which we have under Works, um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a link to our research paper that kind of dives a little deeper into our research um, and gives some good examples. Um, and please, I mean, if you have a thought or an idea or want to push back or destroy something, um, one of our ideas, um, please reach out to our team. This is about collaboration and learning from each other. Uh, we can't stress that enough. Um, and I'm sure some of you here have ideas that we'd love to hear and we'd love to impact our work going forward. Well, Jennifer, Laura, Chad, thanks very much. Um, we appreciate all that you've been able to share with us and look forward to more work to come. I know our Equity, Diversity, and Inclusiveness Committee was very pleased to have this as a topic of conversation. Um, and again, it's not just a for a singular client or one firm to pursue or a specific project type. It's, it's a lens through which you can apply to, to any kind of client interaction, any project type, because um, even if you have not experienced trauma, you will benefit from a trauma-informed design. Um, so thanks for your participation today and everybody who was able to join the call. Next week, we have um, an encore presentation of our 2020 Design and Honor Awards program. And we'll hear from the Design Awards Chair um, before we have the uh, encore presentation of that. 
to see how that goes. So we hope, look forward to seeing you then, if not on another future event. So thanks everyone for joining us and especially to the ShopWorks team. Take thank care. You. Yeah, thanks thank all. you.